Well, good morning, Westwood family. It is great to be with you this morning, and I hope that you've been able to enjoy some of the beautiful weather that's finally come to us and uh, been able to gain some energy from, from that as we go through all of these different transitions. Um, and today we're, we're still continuing in our summer in the Psalms, and today we're looking at Psalm 51. And Psalm 51 comes out of an historical account in 2 Samuel 12, and I'll share that with you in just a moment. But if you want to turn to Psalm 51 in your Bibles or in the Bible app, um, please do that. But one of the things that we're going to be exploring today is the idea of shame and guilt. And how do we process that? How do we deal with it? And I remember the first time that I really felt shame and guilt. My mom had a hair appointment at one of my relatives' place, and she was getting her, her hair cut, and I was just playing with toys in their living room. And one of the boxes they had of toys was just a box of watches that didn't work. And I was just sort of, you know, rooting through the watches. And I finally found one. It was shiny. It was, it was silver and huge. And I was just like, that's, that started sort of my love for watches. I love watches. And I looked at this shiny piece of, uh, of technology. And I thought, there's a lot of watches here. They're all broken. If I take this one, no one's really going to notice. So I slipped the, the watch into my pocket. And at that instant, I knew that I was doing something wrong. I didn't really understand why I was feeling guilty at that point, because I was still, uh, you know, I was under four when it happened. And then I just left it there, and I'm like, I'm going to play with this later at my house. And so on the way home, uh, I, I took the watch out of my pocket and I said, look what I found, mom. I found a watch. And she's like, uh, where did you get that watch? And I said, um, at our relative's house. And she's like, oh, really? And, and then I really realized that something wasn't quite right. And I got a little bit of a lecture on stealing and why it was wrong to steal someone else's property. And then we turned the car around and went back to the house and, and I was weeping and, and I was mourning and I felt terrible for what I had done. And uh, I, I gave the watch back to my relative and apologized. And in grace, they said, I forgive you. And my conscience all of a sudden was clear and I was like, hey, I don't, I don't feel bad anymore. This was a good thing, what just happened here. But it taught me uh, a lifelong lesson about shame and guilt and, and how it all starts. But how do we get rid of the guilt that we sometimes feel? In each of us, there is something that desires to do wrong, to get away with things, to cover up hidden faults, to hide from those who love us, to hide from God. And on a small scale... We have the guilt we feel when we have done something wrong and haven't owned up to it. But on a cosmic scale, there is a weight on each person because of the sin that we have that separates us from God. We're guilty before God. Not because we're more or less broken. That's a little bit too easy of a word. We're separate from God because we are guilty of sin. And this is true for everyone. And this guilt, if we're honest and we're healthy with our feelings, it can lead to shame. And shame leads to a myriad of things. It can lead to despair, to you know, hopelessness, to numbness, to rebellion, to submission, to surrender. And in the Psalms we're looking at over the next two weeks, Psalm 51 and Psalm 32, we'll look at how one person, King David, expressed their guilt and shame in a healthy way and encountered a God who wanted nothing more than to restore them and bring freedom. So what do we do with that guilt? What do we do with our shame? And I'm not talking about the shame that sometimes comes from when you know, we're abused by others, either emotionally or physically. Or bullying that happens to us that makes us feel 
less than we really are. Those are sins committed against us. And they can cause the same emotions, shame and guilt. But they're healed differently by God. Because He hurts with us when those things happen to us. He grieves that those things happen. And today He wants you to know that those are not what define you. He hurts and grieves with you in what has happened and He wants to bring you freedom by coming alongside and saying, you are worthy of all the love that I have to give. Walk with me. Release the pain to me and I will restore or I will start to restore what was taken. But the kind of guilt and shame we're talking about today is the result of us sinning and how we work through that. And in David's life in, in 2 Samuel chapters 11 and 12, there's a story uh, of him sort of establishing his kingdom, the temple. Uh, he wants to build a temple, but he's already built a, a palace for himself. He set himself up well in the land. He's brought neighboring nations into submission. He's defeated a bunch of his enemies. And then he sort of takes a break. And one of the enemies that he hadn't defeated, the Ammonites, uh, were still at war with him. And war was a seasonal thing. There was a time of the year when you would go off to war. And that's what happened. Uh, David sent his army under the command of Joab to attack the Ammonites. But instead of going with them like he normally did, he decided to, to stay home, maybe take it easy. He definitely had a, a different uh, sleep-wake cycle than some people because uh, he rose late one day. Actually, it was the evening. And he was just taking a stroll on his palace, looking around at probably, you know, the city of Jerusalem, his kingdom, when he happened to see a beautiful woman who was bathing herself. And people in those days, they bathed on their rooftops for the most part because of the privacy it offered. But, you know, with a king and a big palace, there wasn't a lot of privacy if you lived close to him. And so David sees this lady and he's amazed at her beauty. And he inquires, you know, who is this lady? And they tell him, uh, that's Bathsheba. She's married to a guy named Uriah who's a Hittite. And David says, okay, I want to I meet this woman. And so he sends messengers to bring her to the palace. And there he abuses his power as king and forces her to sleep with him because there is a power imbalance there. How are you going to say no to the king of Israel when you're one of his subjects? And in many instances, we would say that's rape. And so... The event happens. It seems to be all over. David wasn't looking for another wife. He was just looking for a conquest. And things go south when Bathsheba sends word to David that she is pregnant. So what does he do? First, he tries to cover it up by inviting her husband, Uriah, to come back home. And he hopes that Uriah will go visit his wife, Bathsheba, and they'll sleep together, and she'll be pregnant, and he'll think, oh, I'm the father. And so there's this pretense. But Uriah, who's an honorable man, refuses to go home to his wife because all of his companions, his fellow soldiers, are off fighting a war. And he's not going to enjoy the comforts of home while those guys are dying for the nation. So David tries another, tries to get him drunk so that he'll go home. Still doesn't do it. So he sends Uriah with a letter back to Joab, saying, you know what? Put your eye in the front where the fighting is heaviest. And when you get close, pull back from him so that he is killed in battle. Kind of a horrible thing to send someone with their own death note. And so Uriah is killed. And David, he doesn't even go into mourning. He doesn't even try to be hypocritical. When other mighty men of Israel died, David led the nation in mourning. When Saul, his enemy, died, he mourned for him. When the king of the Ammonites, who they were fighting, died, David mourned for him. He is not sorry for what happened to Uriah. He even sends a note to Joab saying, hey, take it easy, don't worry about it, everything's okay. 
why this happened. But Bathsheba, she goes into mourning for her husband. She's devastated by it. And when her mourning time had passed, David took Bathsheba into his house. And she gives birth to a son. And you wonder, why did David all of a sudden take Bathsheba into his house as one of his wives? I don't think he was trying to cover up his sin any longer. It's too late for that. She must be showing her, you know, she must have been showing her pregnancy. People probably wondering, how did this happen? And then she gets moved into the palace. So obviously there was something up there with the King David. And at the end of this story, this is what was recorded. A simple phrase. But the thing David had done displeased the Lord. So Nathan, the prophet, was sent by God to confront David and share what God's judgment would be. And I encourage you to read it in 2 Samuel. And Nathan says to him, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says, I anointed you king over Israel and I delivered you from the hand of Saul. I gave your master's house to you and your master's wives into your arms. I gave you all Israel and Judah and had this had been too little, I would have given you even more. Why did you despise the word of the Lord by doing what is evil in his eyes? You struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword and took his wife to be your own. You killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. Now therefore, the sword will never depart from your house because you despised me and took the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your own. God's statements, I made you king. I gave you Israel. I would have given you even more. So now the sword will always be part of your house. The judgment on David. And he had even said that other people would sleep with his wife like he had slept with Bathsheba. And that the son born to him and Bathsheba would die. And those things all happened. And David's response, and this is where we get to see the heart of a leader and a person who is humbled and who is truly showing humility. Then David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And then Nathan replied, The Lord has taken away your sin. You are not going to die. But because by doing this you have shown utter contempt for the Lord, the son born to you will die. And you think, just like that, your sin is taken away? There were still consequences, yes, but you're just forgiven? David abused his power through adultery, murder, lying, rape. It says he despised the word of the Lord, and did evil. And when you look at the Ten Commandments, he broke four of the six relating to how we're called to treat others. Coveting, adultery, murder, bearing false witness. All of the dirt. All of this stuff from a man who is described as being after God's own heart. And something that is unique about the Bible compared to all other religious writings is it doesn't shy away from the faults of its heroes. It puts them out there for everyone to see. These heroes aren't there for us to see how great and good they are, but that we get to see how good and great God is. And it points to how God is working in all of history for our sake and not his. And one of the most important texts in the New Testament for how Christ relates to, to us and to the people of the Old Testament who really sought after him. In Romans 3, 25-28, this is what it says about Jesus. For God presented Jesus as the sacrifice for sin. People are made right with God when they believe that Jesus sacrificed his life, shedding his blood. And this sacrifice shows that God was being fair when he held back and did not punish those who sinned in times past, David. For he was looking ahead and including them in what he would do in this present time. God this did this to demonstrate his righteousness, for he himself is fair and just, and he makes sinners right in his sight when they believe in Jesus. Can we boast then? 
that we have done anything to be accepted by God? No, because our acquittal is not based on obeying the law. It's based on faith. So we are made right with God through faith and not by obeying the law. So this former sin of David's, while it did have consequences, it did not lead to David's condemnation because there was someone greater at work. And out of this event comes one of the few psalms tied to historical events. It's the honest response of David to God for what he has done. And it's taken a while for us to get to this psalm, but we needed that backstory to understand all this. And it starts, For the director of music, a psalm of David, when the prophet Nathan came to him after David had committed adultery with Bathsheba. It goes, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. According to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions, and my sin is always before me. Against you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so you are right in your verdict and justified when you judge. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Yet you desired faithfulness even in the womb. You taught me wisdom in that secret place, Cleanse me with hyssop, and I will be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins, and blot out all my iniquity. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence, or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Then I will teach transgressors your ways so that sinners will turn back to you. Deliver me from my guilt of bloodshed, O God. You who are God my Savior, and my tongue will sing of your righteousness. Open my lips, Lord, and my mouth will declare your praise. You do not delight in sacrifice, or I would bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. My sacrifice, O God, is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, you, God, will not despise. May it please you to prosper Zion, to build up the walls of Jerusalem. Then you will delight in the sacrifices of the righteous, in burnt offerings offered whole. Then bulls will be offered on your altar. And many of us, when we're reading that psalm, will jump on the line against you, and you only have I sinned. Really? What about the dead soldier at the city where he was fighting? What about the lies? What about the rape? What about the dragging other people into your sin? And David is not saying that he didn't sin against these people. From what we know of his character, he would have made restitution with those he had wronged. But in this psalm, it is between David and God who anointed him king. This is the God that David was deeply in love with and adored. This is the God that David had grieved and it wrecked him. And ultimately, David recognizes how far he has strayed from God and his word, and his sin overwhelms him. So he does the only thing he knows. He turns to God. He knows who God is. A God of justice, yes. A God of righteousness, yes. But also a God of unfailing love and compassion. And in his guilt and shame, he no longer tries to cover it up or hide from it or numb it, or ignore it. He puts in front of himself and God, and he turns to the God who is always and will always be for him. How do I deal with my shame and guilt? The first step is to know who God is, and know that God is a God of unfailing love and compassion. In another Psalm of David, in Psalm 103, verses 10 to 12, this is what it says about God. He does not punish us for all our sins. He does not deal harshly with us as we deserve. For His unfailing love towards those who fear Him is as great as the height of the heavens above the earth. He has removed our sins as far as the east is from the west. And in this psalm, David recognizes his sin and he owns it. And if I want to get rid of my guilt and shame over my sin... I need to recognize it and own it. As a family, 
at Westwood. Our goal is to bring Jesus into life by becoming an increasingly healthy, vibrant, and effective witness for Jesus in Prince George and around the world. Recognizing our sin and confessing it to God is a huge part of this, both as a family and as individuals in that family. Think about this. Every moment of our life is lived in the presence of God. Have you ever thought of that? God is here now. God is with you when you close the door to your office. God is with you when you're alone with your girlfriend. God is with you when you're watching TV or going on the internet. And that isn't meant as a worrying thing where you go, oh great, God is policing me. God is there because He desires what is best for you. How aware are you of His presence? David hid his sin. It was killing him. And when he was confronted with it, he wasn't upset. Well, maybe he was upset that he was caught at first, like we all are sometimes, right? We get a little defensive. What you, who are you to say that to me? Shut up. But it quickly changed that he was upset that he had sinned and hurt the heart of God and others. He recognized that he had been living independently of God. Think about this. How much of your life is lived with little or no thoughts of God? What would you do differently in various, various activities of the day if you were more aware of God's presence? One thing that I pray often is, God, make me aware of your presence. Because who God is, His loving, kind, compassionate, slow to anger, righteous. Because of who He is and how He sees me, someone needing desperately to be saved from my sin, and doing something about it in Christ is more important than who I am and how I and others see me. David knew this. He threw himself in front of God, owning his sin. And he calls it so many different things here. This is the start of David dealing with his guilt and shame. He calls what he did a few different things. Transgressions. He broke the law that God had given to the Israelites, and he owns it. He despised the word of the Lord. He owned that. He calls it iniquity. He caused an offense against God and others. He perverted what was right, and he owns it. He calls it sin, missing the mark. He engaged in something that went against the character of God. And he owns it. He calls it evil. He did something that was morally wrong. And he owns it. How often do we own what we have done that breaks relationship with God and others? David sets an incredible example for us. He recognizes his sin, how deep it goes, and he turns to the only person he knows that can deal with it. He turns to God, and he prays for cleansing. Wash me, cleanse me, purge me with hyssop. Hyssop was a branch used by priests to sprinkle blood on a house that had a disease, like a mold in it. And that branch, sprinkling the blood, would declare that house clean when the mold was gone. God is ready and willing to take all our sins through Jesus Christ and His death on the cross and declare us clean. But we need to be honest with Him and recognize that we need to be cleansed. And then David confesses how serious his sin is. It's like a, a film is playing on repeat in David's mind. He can't stop it. So he gives it to the only person who can remove the film reel. He gives it to God. He recognizes that even from birth, he has wanted to go his own independent way from God instead of towards Him. He grieves that he has broken relationship with his God and it's crushing him. Then he prays for renewal. In Psalm 51.10, Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. What is amazing in this psalm is that David isn't praying specifically 
for help with what brought him down in the first place. The impure thoughts and actions that were being held against him. He doesn't pray for sexual restraint or accountability or protected eyes you know, and sex-free thoughts. Why? Because those are symptoms of deeper issues. He has taken his eyes off of a loving God who wants a deep relationship with him. A lot of people ask, you know, why doesn't accountability work? And it's because we focus, when we, when most of the time when we do accountability, we focus on sinning less and being good more. For accountability to work, the first person we need to be honest with is God and ourself. We need to pursue God together delighting in the fact that we are saved by Jesus from our sins and we're free to follow Him. And we'll explore that next week in Psalm 32. So for accountability to work, we need to pursue and delight in Jesus more than we delight in going our own independent way and sinning. So one of the first accountability questions that I think we need to start asking each other if we're going to go anywhere below the surface and actually deal with the real issues is how are you delighting in the presence of God in your life? And David's prayer in this psalm is a prayer to be made right with the only being in the universe who can love him completely. And David sees that. So what step can we take? We offer the same sacrifice that David did. My sacrifice, O God, is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart you, God, will not despise. And this is the beautiful flavor of the Christian life. Pride keeps us from recognizing our sin and going our own way. Humility frees us to recognize that we need to be freed from our sin. Turn to God. Acknowledge that we are sinners in need of rescuing, owning it, and falling at the feet of Jesus who alone can give us what we need, cleansing from our sin and a joy in Him and the salvation that He freely gives us. Only in Christ can our our guilt and our shame be removed from us. What's more, He wants desperately to remove it so that we can have the same relationship with the Father that David did. It's a simple verse, but it's so profound. 1 John 1.9 If we confess our sins to Him, to Jesus... He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all wickedness. If you have been living in guilt and shame, I want to ask you, we're going to uh, listen to a song. I want you to sing together with it um, based on Psalm 51 and sing it as a song of both repentance and confession and a song that brings you forgiveness. Compassion uncompromising Favor freely give What kindness can forgive The darkness of my sin You love like many waters Why Repair my 
As we finish our time together, let me leave you with this. In Jesus and through Jesus, we may approach God with freedom and confidence. In 2 Corinthians 3.17, it says, For the Lord is spirit, and wherever the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Live in that freedom this week. God, I pray your blessing on everyone who's uh, watching and listening in. God, that we would know the freedom that you have to offer, that we would know your presence every moment of every day, and that we would take joy in your salvation. And when we sin, God, we pray that we would confess it right away. God, that we would delight in our relationship with you, the way you delight in having a relationship with us. In your name, amen. Have a great week, folks.